So hello everyone and thank you very much for joining today. Welcome to Eurodrug's seventh virtual symposium titled Modern Organic Synthesis. This time our invited speakers will be presenting and discussing some of their work on method development for natural product synthesis. I'm Anne Nice, the editor-in-chief of Eurodrug and it's my great pleasure to host this event today on behalf of the whole editorial team and also Chemistry Europe, the journal society owners. As you have seen, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today and presenting their research will be Jinghan Gui from the Shanghai Institute of Organic Chemistry, Mariola Tortosa from the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid and Jerome Baza from the EPFL in Lausanne. I will guide you through the symposium introducing the speakers and I'm very happy that Burkhard König, the chair of Eurodoc, is with me again today and he will be moderating the Q&A sessions after each of the talks. We encourage you to take part in the discussion and um, to do so, please send in your questions through the chat. It would be great if you could tag the speakers with their names so that we can identify the questions more easily. My colleague Charlotte Gaspanta is also with me today and she's supporting us backstage. So if you have any technical problems or general comments, please also let us know in the chat and the two of us will try to respond to them as best as we can. And now let me introduce the first speaker of the event, Jing Han Gui, our Eurodoc Award Lecturer. So this lecture award was given out for the first time in 2020. And for this, the editorial office made a pre-selection of the best papers published by an early career researcher in 2019. Based on the short list, our editorial and also advisory board voted anonymously for Jing Han's paper, making him the Eurodoc 2020 Award Lecturer. So please also don't forget to check out his paper. Jing Han, again, on behalf of the editorial office and also the board, congratulations. We're very happy that you will be presenting here today. And now a bit about Jing Han. So Jing Han received his Bachelor in Chemistry in 2007 at the Anhui Norma University under the supervision of Jin Min Hu. For his PhD, he then moved to Shanghai to the Shanghai Institute of Organic Chemistry to perform research in the group of Wai Shen Tiang, completing his thesis in 2012. He stayed on at the SIOC for another year um, before he then went to the US to do a postdoc with Phil Barron at the Scripps Institute. Since 2016, he holds his current position at the SIOC in Shanghai. Xinghan's research focuses on the development of bio-inspired strategic transformations for the efficient and scalable preparation of complex molecules. And this is also the topic of today's Eurodoc Award Lecture, Efficient Synthesis of Steroid and Terpenoid Natural Products. So Jinghan, I would now like to ask you to share your screen and we very much look forward to your award lecture. Thank you. Good, yeah. Is that good? Perfect, yeah, we can see your slides and your, your video. Perfect, thank you, Gina. Okay, uh, thanks Sam for the kind of introduction. And also thank you and uh, Professor Koenig for the kind of invitation. So it is my great honor to have this opportunity to present our work in the past five years since I come back to SLC. So the topic of, of uh, my talk today is uh, efficient synthesis of steroid and uh, terpenoid natural products. Our research interest is focused on natural product synthesis. But, uh, here I'd like to use a finger from my uh, postdoc advisor, Phil Barron's uh, uh, perspective uh, paper on ideal synthesis. He said the stage was now set for organic chemists to uh, uh, think about the way the molecules are synthesized. So it's all about the efficiency. So our research program aims to develop concise, scalable, and uh, divergent uh, road to these uh, complex molecules from simple starting material. And we are particularly interested in steroid natural products because steroid medicine is uh, widely used for the treatment of virus diseases. And here are two recent examples. One is uh, Braxi, no, no, 
And uh, it is the first and the only medicine approved by FDA for the treatment of uh, PPD. And another is uh, dexamethasone. It can cut death from COVID-19 by one third among critically ill patients. So the great advantage of uh, dexamethasone is that it is not in short supply and also available as a pill. So the uh, steroid uh, nature products usually have a, a high oxidation state and a complex core framework, and many of them have rearranged the skeleton. So to develop a concise route to these molecules from simple available, uh, easy available materials, two, uh, two key issues need to be solved. First, since the steroid core is uh, nearly hydrocarbon, we need to uh, do a selective CH oxidation to install the oxidation, oxidation state at specific positions. Second, we need to achieve controllable skeleton rearrangement to rapidly access the core framework. So the steroid uh, nature process can uh, structurally they can be divided into two classes. Uh, one is the abel steroid, which features the bond migration. And another is a secular steroid, which features the cleavage of one or more CC bonds. So today I want to present how we use a unified biomimetic strategy to uh, complete the synthesis of these molecules in a concise and efficient fashion. The, uh, the biomimetic synthesis of a natural product has a long history and is a uh, uh, frequently used by us nowadays. The so most uh, classic example is Hescock's uh, landmark synthesis of this uh, complex alkaloid in uh, 1990. Uh, from this uh, uh, linear precursor, he was able to obtain the product in two steps via several cascade processes. The first example is a cyclocytinol. Uh, you can see its structure is very different from the classical steroid. It has a bicycle 441 AB ring system. So we are interested in how this structure was made in nature. For the biosynthetic proposal, it was proposed that the acrosteroid first undergo a muscle, act muscle activation to install a living group here, and this dye-in undergo a uh, sacropropanation and then sacropropane fragmentation to this, give this uh, core uh, structure. So we need to first prepare this uh, dying precursor and uh, investigate this key transformation. So our synthesis use uh, pregnanol as a uh, cheap starting material and in four step we achieve the uh, site oxidation of the angular methyl group. And the dying precursor was uh, obtained through the sulfoxide uh, thermal animation. So this intermediate can uh, undergo the desired uh, sacropropanation to give this uh, cat uh, catenine uh, intermediate. And the deprenation uh, at this position will lead to the opening of the sacropropane to give the uh, this triene as the major product and it is also our desired product. So from this sulfur so outside to this uh, triene, it is one cascade uh, process. And uh, this triene can undergo the selective hydroboration to give this uh, ketone intermediate. That is only nine step from pregnanol and all the reactions were performed on gram scale. And from this uh, uh, key intermediate, intermediate, we were able to achieve the Divergent synthesis of 10 natural products by introducing the side chain. So it just takes us uh, 10 to 12 steps to finish the synthesis of these molecules. And in the synthesis of the cyclocytinol, we follow the biosynthetic proposal and achieve the uh, construction of this uh, 441 ring system. It, this this step is can be formally viewed as a one to migration of carbon five. So we consider uh, can we uh, achieve the one to migration of this carbon carbon nine uh, to get easy access to the six seven six uh, ring system. So the nature uh, the rep 
most representative natural product is a propane dialect gene. Actually, this natural product is not a steroid, but a nortriterpenoid. It has a unique and a complex 55765 pentacyclic framework. So our question again is how this uh, structure was made in nature. So when Sir and co-works isolate this uh, uh, nature product, they propose that the core framework can be derived from derived from the style intermediate from transacidification and the oxide micro addition to give this uh, core framework. So this gave us a significant separation on the synthetic strategy. We are also uh, intrigued, intrigued by the structure feature of this natural product. Also, it is not a steroid. It is a, a structure is very similar to the steroid. They share the same steroid genetic centers highlighted in red and the similar CB, uh, CD ring system here. And the main difference lies in the highly oxygenated uh, 557 fused ring system and uh, still chemistry at uh, this position. So to develop a, a concise route to this molecule from the steroid, there are several uh, issues need to be solved, such as the selective CH oxidation and the controllable skeleton rearrangement, as I mentioned in the beginning. So for the selective CH oxidation, starting from this uh, 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 steroid lactone uh, study material, uh, we first use the uh, uh, breast remote functionaliz functionalization to introduce a double bond here. And then we use the surface remote func radical functionalization to install a hydroxy group here. Then we convert this uh, hydroxy to a methylate. And we are lucky to find that this methylate can undergo the desired one to shift to give the B ring expanded uh, product. However, we are uh, uh, surprised to find that this uh, the configura configuration of the newly formed stereogenic center is uh, opposite to that of the natural product. So we need to invert this uh, stereogenic center, which is uh, uh, very challenging in organic chemistry. To solve this issue, we first perform a Mukayama hydroperoxidation to give this uh, cellulated peroxide. And then we are uh, very uh, happy to find that this peroxide can undergo the desired intramolecular cyclization to give this uh, endoperoxide. And our x ray shows that this uh, uh, tertiary steel center, the, the, his, the uh, configuration was uh, uh, Inver inverted uh, during these processes. So with this intermediate in hand, we can easily get access to the precursor of the key transformation. So upon reduction of the peroxide bond using zinc and acetic acid, we can give this a dial intermediate and it undergoes the uh, transacidification and then the oxomicro addition cascade automatically uh, in, in the reaction system to give the pentacyclic framework. So we, we then introduce the side chain through the sharpless dihydroxylation and complete the, the synthesis of this uh, complex nortriterpenoid nature product starting from a steroid study material. So in the previous two synthesis, the synthetic proposal was successfully realized to enable uh, efficient synthesis. So our question is, when this uh, uh, key biosynthetic transformation cannot work in our, in, in our hand, so what can we do? So the, the answer is, uh, it can also provide significant uh, in, in information to develop a practical approach. So here is an example. So the Pinagogius is a, a line 11 cycle steroid, and they each have a have the same side chain. And the only uh, difference is that the natural product, product shown on the left has a complex and a heavily rearranged skeleton. So uh, we consider the, how uh, maybe they have some uh, biosynthetic correlation in the nature. So we want to 
uh, investigate its synthesis. As for the, for the biosynthetic proposal, Kigushi proposed that pininistero uh, E can un first undergo the alpha ketone rearrangement to give this uh, seven five uh, ring system. And this uh, intermediate can undergo the vaninergous alpha ketone rearrangement to give this intermediate. And the further protonation and the hemiketone formation can give the, uh, another complex natural product, Pinigogius E. So we are interested in the feasibility of this uh, biosynthetic proposal. And if it is not working, what is the problem? So we first developed a gram scale synthesis of uh, Pinister E in 10 steps, and its structure was confirmed by X-ray. However, we are uh, surprised to find that this that desired uh, uh, tangent process cannot uh, work in our hand. The only product we isolate is this uh, amphimer. So we think that uh, this product might be formed from the alpha keto rearrangement to give this intermediate. And it uh, doesn't undergo the desired uh, migration of carbon-5, but the carbon chain undergoes the migration to give this amphimer. So we think the problem lies in, in the second step that is uh, carbon-5 migration from carbon-6 to carbon-7. So since the cascade rearrangement is challenging, so we consider can we do it step wisely? That is the first uh, break this uh, bond and then connect the carbon-5 to carbon-7 bond. So we then uh, develop a design an alternative stepwise approach. The first is uh, do a semi pinnacle rearrangement to give this uh, a 7 5 diketone intermediate. So this is uh, uh, can be isolated. And then we can break the uh, carbon 5 to carbon 6 uh, bond and then connect the pivotal carbon 5 to carbon 7 bond through an azo radical cyclization. So for the synthetic step, starting from this uh, uh, long compound, we can get this dialogue in, in four steps. So we found that this intermediate can undergo the semi pinnacle rearrangement to give this uh, seven membered seven -membered ketone intermediate. And the cleavage of the C ring and the A ring through olefin ozonolysis gives this a disecal intermediate. So we then convert this uh, carboxylic acid to the uh, to a uh, sour ester, and this is the only uh, radical. A uh, precursor that can undergo the desired uh, radical cyclization in our hand. So we uh, we are very excited to find that the this uh, acyl radical can undergo the desired cyclization and the hemiketolization uh, cascade to give the nature product. So this uh, ratio also formed the two rings and the three continuous steogenic centers in a in a single step. So in this way, we complete a concise synthesis of these two molecules that are also inspired by the biosynthetic proposal. So this is the, uh, the last part of my talk. So uh, we want to demonstrate the application of a biosynthetic proposal in the structural revision of natural products. And uh, so the serocladion is uh, uh, First is the first uh, disecal steroid. It has a, a unique microcyclic diketone uh, framework, and its structure is determined by AMR data. So for the uh, our synthetic pathways, the P transformation is the endoperoxide fragmentation to give to cleave these two CC bond to give this uh, microcyclic uh, diketone motif. And the first uh, oxamicro addition in the six angel trig manner then gives this uh, six membered uh, pyrenol motif. So if you look at this uh, uh, biosynthetic proposal closely, it may suggest the structural ambiguities. So in two aspects. First, uh, so the oxamicro addition uh, can also under go through the five axle trick manner to give the five-membered uh, furanol motif. 
And the second, we found that the, the stereogenic center configuration of this uh, center in the proposed uh, structure is opposite to that in the study material, the agro theory. So that is very strange. So the, these two points attract our attention, and then we, we decided to investigate its true structure through chemical synthesis. So the key reaction is the endoprocyte fragmentation. So for, the, for this transformation, we pretty previously found that this uh, uh, furin derived uh, endoprocyte can undergo the fragmentation to give, give this alkyne product. And then we use this method to complete the synthesis of anglatomin B. If you perform the uh, oxidation in methanol, you can uh, get this uh, hydroperoxide instead. Uh, fragmentation of this intermediate in the presence of iron 2 can give you a, 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 a costly radical, alkyl radical uh, very smoothly. And this can be trapped by virus reagents to give the functionalized butanoid. So in this reaction, we we provide uh, easy access to this uh, functionalized butanoid from easily available furan study material. And then we demonstrate its synthetic utility through, simpli through the simplify the synthesis of uh, several butanoid motifs. And we are very happy this work was published in year uh, GOC and uh, very uh, happy to get this uh, lecture award. And uh, back to this uh, 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 synthesis, so we've, after three, uh, a, a lot of uh, catalysts, we found this uh, racine 2 catalyst was optimum, optimal to cleave, cleave this two CC bond, and uh, which allowed us to get easy access to the diketone uh, product in moderate to good yields. And uh, this reaction also works for the steroid uh, substrate which uh, can be a useful rash, uh, method for the preparation of this uh, uh, dicycle steroid. So for the synthesis of uh, cyclodiome, this uh, angioproxide can undergo the fragmentation and the cyclosa oxidation to give this dieno intermediate. And the uh, oxy microaddition under acidic conditions gives a natural product, which was identical to the nature isolate by AMR data. But our X-ray data shows that it has a five-membered furanol motive rather than a six-membered pureno motive. So we revise the structure through chemical synthesis and also its biosynthetic pathway. But you can see in our synthesis, we need to first hydro hydrogenate this double bond and introduce this double bond again later in the synthesis. So we can see that can we do this fragmentation on this uh, unsaturated uh, uh, substrate. Luckily, we found that this uh, uh, substrate can also undergo the fragmentation and the oxy addition in a cascade uh, process to give the natural product in just uh, two steps from the agrosteroid. OK, to sum summarize our work in the area of natural product synthesis, we think the, there are at least three advantages for the biomimetic synthesis. First, it uh, gives us uh, uh, important in, uh, information on how the molecules were made in nature. So we can mimic the key biosynthetic transformation in the laboratory and uh, develop a concise synthetic route. Second, the successful implementing of, su of such a strategy can provide exper experimental evidence for the possible biosynthetic pathway. And third, it can also may also suggest the structure misassignment of nature product and uh, guide the structure revision. And here is a list of nature products we synthesized uh, recently. So apart from steroid nature product, we are also interested in the diterpene nature product, such as uh, this one, the winkle, which are not covered today due to the time limitations. And last, I would like to thank my students uh, for their hard work especially Yu Wang, Jia Chen, Xin Hui, and Yu Han. And also, thank you for the funding agents, and uh, thank you for your kind attention. Yeah, Yu Han, thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. A lot of chemistry in a short time, amazing molecules and great transformations. Um, yeah, now there's time for discussion, and I encourage our audience, and I think we have 
close to 400 people that have tuned in to post the questions in the chat, just write in the chat, and then uh, we can uh, direct the questions to Ching Han. Let me start with one question. I was, of course, intrigued by the ACL radical formation in one of your syntheses, and you made the ACL radical by making first the thioester, and then the thioester by radical um, reaction get the ACL radical. Maybe you can very quickly explain us how this works, because maybe not everybody in the audience is familiar with the with the uh, reaction, uh, because there are many other ways to make ACL radicals. You can also maybe comment on the on the, the, the benefits of this method. OK, so we try other uh, uh, ACL radical precursor like a selenium. The precursor, it does not work in our hands for the radical cyclization. So this precursor is developed by Crick, and the mechanism is the first abstract the aldine to give this uh, aryl radical, and they will attack this uh, 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 sulfur, uh, sulfur to give this uh, five memory and uh, give this uh, to clip this uh, 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 carbon sulfur bond harmonically, and then give this. Uh, uh, iso radical. So we found that this uh, uh, cell acid is very stable. So and uh, it can be easily can easily generate the iso radical under a uh, very uh, conditional conditions. So that is uh, uh, what we think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quite nice. Now interesting. So now questions coming in. So there's one question here from from Durga. Uh, I think from from Bangalore. Um, uh, could you please comment on the selectivity of hydro of the hydroboration step in the synthesis of cyclocitrinol? Oh, uh, this step, right? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we found that uh, this uh, it is uh, is innate reactivity. So this uh, double bond is most reactive. So if you can choose the. Uh, the reagent, this step on the re, uh, react first, and then maybe this bond will re, uh, react uh, later. So if you can control the equivalent of the reagent, you can selective oxidize this bond. And uh, in this uh, 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 during this process, this ketone is also got reduced. But after you add the Jones reagent, uh, this position is oxidized, and uh, its uh, alcohol is also oxidized back to the ketone. So we can get, get this uh, uh, diketone product from this uh, one pot procedure. Right. OK, thanks a lot. There was one more general question uh, from the audience. You showed us impressively that you do gram scale sequences of, of these reactions. And, and we see it here, three gram scale, six gram scale. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so what's the amount of starting material you start up with? Maybe uh, um, uh, uh, several, maybe uh, 100 uh, gram of the starting material. And uh, so we need to, uh, so we need to prepare a lot of the intermediate for the investigation, for the optimization of the key reaction. So that consume a lot of the material. So as maybe we use uh, about uh, 100 gram or, yeah. Right, okay. I would have a more kind of a little bit, uh, what, what, again, a more general question. When I look at yes. all of these uh, uh, structures, so, so you, you work in method development and at the same time, of course, you make these very nice structures to confirm, let's say, natural product structures are there. Yeah, and yeah. When, when, when you reflect on, on, on the way you, you tackle these problems in there, um, when you select your targets on there, uh, so what comes first? Do you select the targets you make by the methods that you would like to apply? or you select the target you would like to make in synthesis and then start also developing the method to get there. So is, is your, your chemical program, your research program more method driven or more target driven? As a more kind of general question, I think the audience may be interested in that. So I think it's a more kind of the target driven. So we select the, the target that maybe that is a very unique, very novel structures. So the first, uh, Problem we need to solve. Uh, we, we need to solve is can we develop a simple method to access these uh, very beautiful structures? And uh, during this journal, we need to maybe 
develop some new mass new master for their preparation. And in the you can see in the last uh, project, so if you uh, we need to prepare this uh, new uh, this uh, uh, lecture product, so we need to develop a new method for this uh, into peroxide fragmentation. Mm -hmm. So in the synthesis, we develop this. Uh, uh, new new method, so it's kind of it's more like a uh, target driven. Right. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot. That's interesting in a way. There's one more question, uh, and that is regarding the cyclopropane ring opening. We just saw on the slide before. Maybe you can go back to this. Um, and the question is: There is path A and path B, and and what is determining the selectivity here? Can you comment on that? I think it's, it is a steric hindrance of this uh, uh, two hydrogen, and, uh, and this is a, a tertiary hydrogen, and this is a, a, like a secondary hydrogen. So I think this is more accessible for the uh, for the base to deprotonate here and uh, to get this uh, uh, to give this a uh, radio selectivity. And then we also this is I think this more uh, determined by the several hindrance. And the interesting is uh, this is one is more stable. If you subject this of these two structures to acidic, uh, acidic conditions, so this structure will convert to this uh, conjugated triene in very high yield. Right. Yeah, yeah. so it's our, our yeah. Okay, right. There's one follow-up question to, to, to my earlier question, what drives your research? You said you, you, you select an interesting structure and then you develop a method to go there. Um, when selecting this, these are all uh, steroids with unusual systems on there. What is the key important thing? Is it the unusual molecular structure or is this the biological activity that drives your interest? I think it's more is more like uh, the structure. So we are uh, intrigued by the structure beauty of this molecule. So this is a, a list of the common we synthesize. So they all have unusual and maybe unique, very novel structures. So we are uh, interested in how to make this uh, this molecule in the first place, and then maybe we are. Uh, uh, kind of interesting if we can develop the sense of several analogs to see if we have an improved biological activity. So right. our first concern is the uh, structure. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. Good. Good. Okay. So we have to come slowly to an, to an end, but um, there's one more question, a more practical question. We have seen here gram scale synthesis on there. Yeah. Um, and of course, after the reaction, you have to purify. How do you do this? Six gram um, synthesis. How do you? What kind of columns are you using to get your pure material? I mean, the gram scale of the uh, the natural product, or yeah, you have in, in any of the synthetic steps on there. Um, the product typically then has to be purified. So, what methods of yeah. purification are you using? Column chromography, and uh, maybe in the in the first of synthesis when the reaction scale is very large. We use uh, the uh, uh, recrystallization to okay. purify the material. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's what okay. I would guess. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. 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 Thanks a lot. Okay. I think okay, we have to come to an end. Um, questions in the chat will be answered by Jinghan later on by direct reply. That is possible on there. And uh, with this, thank you again for the great lecture. And I give back to Anna for the next presentation. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you, Bokat and Jinghan. So this was already, I think, a very great start um, of this symposium. And I would now like to move on to the second lecture. And it's my pleasure now to introduce the second speaker, Mariola Tortola. So Mariola received her uh, Bachelor in Chemistry in 1999 from the Universitat Autonoma de Madrid. She then joined the group of Fernandes de la Padilla at the Institute of General Organic Chemistry in Madrid for her graduate. After receiving her PhD in 2005, she moved to the Scripps Research Institute in Florida to work as a postdoctoral fellow with William Rush. In 2008, she returned to Madrid to the Institute of General Organic Chemistry as a research assistant. In 2011, she started her independent research at the Universitat Autonoma de Madrid as assistant professor and was then promoted in 2017 to associate professor. 
Her research interests um, focus on the chemistry of boronic esters, as well as asymmetric catalysis and the synthesis of natural products. Today, she will tell us more on how to use catalysis to increase complexity during the stereoselective synthesis of sp3 rich building blocks. So Mariola, um, we look forward to your talk and I would like to ask you now to share the screen. Thank you. Okay, so we can see the slides now. Yeah, if you could turn on your, your camera too, that's possible. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. yes. Is that there you okay go. now? Thank you very much. Yes, all is good now. Thank you all. Thank you, Anton. And Thank you, Miss. It's really a pleasure this screen some speakers and symposiums more and more. Um, so today I will talk about the things that we treat um, chemistry group with a novel catalytic transfer. And we've done this in carbon boron bond, nitrogen bond, cleavage. In the middle of time, I will focus more on bond formation. Outside of, of our, our goal what could be somehow just of biological yeah. So this is why um, Pointed. Yeah. Um, uh, Mariola, more? we have yes. Mariola, we have some problems with your sound. Like um you can really again. Yeah. You can whatever. I can maybe my headphones. Mm. Maybe we have to try without the, f yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting, yeah, but. Is it better? No, it's still um, distorted. No, mm -mm, maybe you can. Strange, it was fine before, yeah. Can you hear me? It, it's a little bit uh, hollowy, yeah. At the, mm, maybe you can. Now? Yeah, but it's still a bit. Maybe you can. Um, maybe you can still try cutting off. Uh, mm, mm -hmm. uh, but the problem or. So maybe we can uh, maybe we can move try and and maybe you can log on and off or maybe turn off the the the, the audio and then try back. back on. Okay. Just a second. Apologies. No. Uh. Uh. No. No? Mm -mm. Not yet. Now we can hear you, but it's again that quality. Maybe I can try with her. No. But. We could try. Maybe you can try logging, like um, logging out and coming back Maybe. in, and we can see you. If it works, better. No, now we can't hear you. Maybe you can try it on and off. Yeah. Um, can you hear me now? Um, maybe Mariola, can you try logging on and off? Yeah. Okay. Apologies. And thank you for your patience. We'll try again. And otherwise, we might have to 
um, yeah, take Jerome's talk first and then see if we can get it get it sorted afterwards. Yeah, this happens from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we will sort it out. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Now it's good. Yeah. Okay. We'll try again. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Apologies. let's try. I'm that. sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. No, don't worry. <laughs> These things happen. So, can you hear me now? Well. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So I was telling you how our goal from the very beginning was to try to develop methods that could be somehow useful for the preparation of biologically active compounds. So this is why natural products and drugs such as those shown here in this slide have been our inspiration be behind many of the methods that we have developed and uh, that I will show today. So um, when you're trying to develop methods to prepare biologically active compounds, sooner or later, you're going to end up creating a stereocenter. And I think this is almost inevitable because, as all we know, nature is three-dimensional. And it is the binding side of the enzyme that is responsible for a biological response. And indeed, in the pharmaceutical industry, we can see the progressive shift from more planar structure to scaffolds that have more two-dimensionality. In 2009, Frank Lovering uh, published a very famous paper that you've probably read in, in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry um, that had a lot of uh, influence in this switching that I was telling you about going from flat to, to more two-dimensional structures. And in this paper that they, they the title is Escape from Flatland, they introduced two new uh, measures of complexity for molecules that were prepared uh, as drug candidates. So one of them was the fraction sp3, which was defined as the number of sp3 carbon divided by the total number of carbons. And the other one was just simple to look if the, if the structure has stereocenters or not. And they found a very interesting correlation between high numbers of sp3 fraction and increasing number of stereocenters with an increased success of molecules going uh, through the process of drug discovery, clinical testing, and finally going uh, uh, as drugs into the market. So today, I would like to tell you, uh, to share with you how we have to escape from flatland and uh, how one of our strategies has been to develop methods that allow us to prepare um, molecules that contain boron stereocenters. So because in doing that, if we have in hand one of these molecules, we know that we have access to a wide variety of derivatives because the carbon boron bond offers a, a great versatility. So the, the traditional way to form carbon boron bonds uh, is based on the electrophilic nature of boron due to the MTB orbital. And while this classical approach works very well for reactions that involve a nucleophilic partner, by its nature it's limited because you are always gonna need that nucleophilic, that nucleophile looking for the MTP orbital. So trying to switch that reactivity, trying to uh, change the electrophilic nature of boron and to generate in situ nucleophilic boron species opens really new ways to uh, introduce boronic esters into organic molecules in ways that were not possible before. And this has actually become a very active area of research in the last 15 years or so. And you can definitely find different ways to generate and to use this kind of nucleophilic boron species. But from all these approaches that we have now in hand, the one that has proven to be most versatile of all is without no doubt the use of copper catalysis. It's been already 20 years since uh, Osomi and Mijara published almost independently the first copper catalyzed borelation of alpha beta and saturated compound. And although they use slightly different conditions that I'm not gonna detail here today, they both agree in the in situ formation of this kind of copper bottle complexes that were behaving as formal boron nucleophiles. And this was truly a fantastic finding because it opened new ways to introduce boronic esters into molecules in ways that were not possible before. Uh, so the way the reaction works is, is by interaction of the LUMO of the alkene and the OMO of the carbon boron bond, bo boron complex, which is a nucleophile. Uh, so this is why at the very beginning of, of this chemistry development, the alkenes that work best in this chemistry 
were those that had electron withdrawing groups attached to the alkene because that way uh, the, the LUMO is lower. So we thought that uh, another way to lower the LUMO, the, the, to lower the LUMO of the alkene without the need of having an electron withdrawing group it, in, in, attached to it was to actually increase the strain. So we thought about using cyclopropenes and cyclobutenes as uh, starting materials in this kind of borrelations. So we were very much intrigued about the chemistry because it was unknown back then, but also very much interested in the products, this kind of cyclopropyl and cyclobutyl boronates. Because these kind of small rings are interesting compounds in drug discovery. They are present in a large number of commercialized drugs. And when you ask a medicinal chemist why they like this small ring so much, the answer you get is pretty much the same always. They are, because they are rigid sp 3 scaffold. They provide rigidity the same way an aromatic ring does, but they also provide three-dimensionality. And another property that these small rings have is that, that they provide an expanded toolbox to actually modulate the physical chemical chemi properties of a target compound. So many, in many times, the introduction, for example, of the three-member ring resulted in an increased metabolic stability. So they are very interesting uh, scaffolds uh, in the drug discovery process. So in this context of preparing a functionalized small ring, we thought that this cyclopropyl and cyclobutyl boronic esters could actually uh, be promising synthetic intermediates because once you have a boron containing stereocenters in one of these molecules, uh, they are configurationally stable. So that means that you can under you can carry out a stereospecific transformations with chirality transfer. And obviously the second reason because uh, th that they are interested in structures is because you have the boral moiety that is providing you a handle for further functionalization. So when we started to work in these molecules, we realized that there were very few methods to prepare those in an enantioselective way. That's why we became interested in those. So our initial idea was try to use a chiral copper boil complex to perform a desimetrization reaction in this kind of prochiral starting materials. And obviously we wanted to do it in an enantio and stereo and stereo selective way. So a few years ago, we, we actually succeeded in, succeed in that. So we were able to find conditions to perform the desimetrization of a cyclopropene um, with a diboron compound to prepare an antimerically enriched cyclopropyl boronates with control both in the dust stereo and in antiselectivity. And we did that using a copper one salt um, an alkoxide and this kind of uh, um, bidetyl ligand, DTBM secfos. Uh, DTBM secfos, one of the nice things about it is that it's commercially available and it's actually relatively cheap compared to other, uh, inexpensive compared to other uh, chiral ligands. So we were able to do that. And we also were able to translate this chemistry to the desimetrization of cyclobutenes. So this was great. This was actually, I think it's one of the most effective, effective reactions that I've ever had have in, my, in my hands, and not just as a PI, but also as a graduate student or postdoc. This kind of desimetrization work beautifully. I mean, we had to tune a little bit the conditions. In this case, we use DM sacfos, but we were able to prepare this kind of a cyclobutyl boronates with three contiguous stereocenters with yields that were almost quantitative and what was more important with almost perfect stereo control. So let me just show you briefly for those of you that are not very familiar with this chemistry, how this reaction worked. So you form in situ a copper bottle complex that undergoes insertion in the presence of a cyclobutene to, to get this cyclobutyl uh, copper complex that in the presence of a proton source would provide the hydroboration product and would generate a copper alkoxide that would start over the catalytic cycle. And this kind of a hydroboration mechanism uh, is very specific for copper because if you compare it with other transition metals, for example, rhodium, with rhodium, the, this car carbon hydrogen bond is formed in an insertion step from a metal hydride intermediate. However, when you have copper, the carbon hydrogen bomb is formed in a protonation step. And that actually opens the possibility to explore um, uh, the possibility of trapping this kind of a, a, a um, copper intermediates with electrophiles 
different than proton. And we explored a little bit that with the cyclobutines, also with the cyclopropines and other, um, other kind of structures. And actually, uh, you, can, you can perform carboboration reactions instead of hydroboration. So instead of using methanol, you have an electrophile, such as methyl iodide. You can trap that intermediate in a catalytic, in the same catalytic cycle to form a structure such as these ones that have one, two, three, four, five, a stereogenic center in one catalytic cycle. So we were obviously very, very happy about, about these kind of structures. We, we thought they could be useful, but at the end, we, we knew that uh, we, were, we had a very obvious limitation is that you needed, in the case of the cyclobutanes, you needed to have or two R groups that were the same, or you needed to have a bicyclic structure. So, if we really wanted people in industry to use this kind of intermediates, this kind of cyclobutyl boronates, we need that we needed to move to structures that were more drug-like. And that's how we became interested in this cyclobutyl spiral cycle. So we were inspired by this uh, beautiful chemical review by Eric Carrera and Thomas Fessar. And in this chemical review, they feature um, the opportunities that this kind of cyclobutyl spiral cycles could offer in drug discovery. So they pointed out how these scaffolds represent poorly spoiled regions of chemical space and how they could provide an expanded toolbox to modulate physical chemical properties of a target molecule. And one of the interesting things about these uh, kind of uh, spiral cycles that have small rings is that they have very well-defined exit vectors. So what does that mean? So in medicinal chemistry, an exit vector is pretty much those points where you can introduce diversification, which as you know, is very important. So when you have an aromatic ring, you pretty much have 2D exit vectors. And if you want to build three-dimensionality, you need to attach here your chiral structures. However, when you have a small ring containing a spiral cycle, the three dimensionality is already embedded in your molecule. So you have in each of the carbons of the spiral cyclic framework, very well defined 3D exit vectors. One of the things we learn about this uh, from this chemical review is that the most general approach to prepare this kind of uh, form of marine spiral cycle is still to use a cyclization and intramolecular and two reaction to build either of the rings here. So this is this works well, it's very robust approach, but it is very linear. So that means that for every kind of uh, spiral cycle that you want to make, you're going to prepare a different starting material. You can also think about a cycle addition, which is very powerful to introduce complexity in a single step, but it's always limited to very, very specific scaffolds. Uh, it is also relatively easy to place exit vectors on terminal heteroatoms, and it's easy because you can build these molecules relatively uh, in, in a relatively easy way uh, you, from more or less feedstock material. However, one thing that is not so easy is to place exit vectors in carbons, on the carbons of the spiral compounds, and to do that in in positions that are orthogonal. So this is a difficult challenge that is not solved. And that's the challenge that we wanted to address with uh, uh, using uh, boronic esters. So this is what we thought. We thought that spirocyclobutines, such as this one, could provide a perfect template and to actually uh, build a method to prepare a wide variety of spirocycles from a common intermediate. So we thought that a diboration would provide this bis organometallic intermediate that has to be to uh, beeping group to boronic ester, ester moieties that could act as orthogonal exit vectors if we could selectively functionalize each of them by carbon boron bond functionalization. So this had uh, several challenges because this diboration was not developed. So we wanted to do it controlling the dust selectivity and the enantiose selectivity, but if successful, actually would provide a very unique way to control the directionality and the nature of the different substituents in the spirocyclic framework. And it would provide a very unique way to prepare a wide variety of spirocycles from a common intermediate. So first, 
we needed to explore this transformation and we, we wanted to have a quick access to these compounds. So that's why we first focus on the racemic uh, preparation of these molecules. And for that, we, we, we took advantage of the transition metal free volylation pioneered by Elena Fernandez for other kind of uh, olefins. And we, we optimized these reactions for the cyclobutins. And we found that using a commercially available uh, diboron compound, a uh, substituent amount of base in methanol, we could access to these molecules um, with high yield. And this method resulted to be quite general for many, many spirocycles that we uh, that we tried. So uh, we could vary very well the linker in the uh, ring that is not the four member ring. And we could also vary very well the, the size. So we could access to systems that are 6-4, 4-4, 7-4. We could have nitrogen, we could have oxygen, sulfur, difluoro. So it was quite general. And one nice thing that we also observe is that in some cases you don't need to have a symmetric cyclobutene to start with. So we could obtain this kind of molecule as a single diastereomer. Um, so this was actually uh, surprising in a way and, and quite nice. So with a with a way to ask to to quick to have a quick access to these kind of uh, molecules, we then started to uh, uh, check what could we do with them. So uh, at the outset, we one of our goals was to try to do a selective Suzuki Mijara cross coupling reaction with these uh, diboronic esters because, as all we know, it's a very well established transformation in industry. So it would provide a very nice way to introduce the spirocyclic framework, for example, in a library of aryl halides. And we were inspired by this pioneer example reported by Jess Morgan in 2014. In this case, he was able to perform a selective Suzuki Mijara cross coupling reaction with the terminal 1 2 diboronate using palladium and uh, aryl bromides. In our case, it was a little bit more challenging because we didn't have a primary versus secondary boronic ester, but we have two secondary boronic esters embedded in the cyclobutane ring. But we thought that the cis disposition of these two B pins uh, could actually facilitate the coordination of one of the oxygen in one of the BP molecules with the boron atom of the next one. And that would increase the Lewis acidity of this boron atom, facilitating a transmetallation. So we first started to check uh, conditions that were close to those used by Morgan. And to our surprise, what we found uh, was that we were getting a decent amount of the cyclobutene that we started with, right? Uh, and we thought that this could be uh, due to the form to this uh, non very a usual beta boreal elimination process. So in this case, we were using a ratio ligand palladium of one to one. And after some experimentation, we observed that increasing this ratio to 2.51, we could actually avoid the beta boreal elimination and we were able to get the desired compound with a, a pretty good yield. This transformation was uh, general and we could do it with a um, large number of spirocycles and with a good number of our bromides, including those containing um, heterocycles. And in those, in all cases, what we observed was retention uh, in this uh, cross coupling. Uh, so we, we could transfer the chirality from this carbon boron stereocenter to uh, the newly created stereocenter. So then we we went further to explore what what could, what could other what we could do more uh, with this kind of a diboreal uh, intermediates. So we we actually found conditions to selectively perform an oxidation of the carbon boron bond of the boreal unit that is less hindered. We could do that controlling the time and the equivalent of the reagent, but. Interestingly, we could also selectively functionalize the internal carbon boron bond through an amination reaction. So this was actually quite nice because it allowed us to actually modify each of the BP molecules in a selective way. So with three ways of performing selective monofunctionalization, then you can think about a bunch of difunctionalization that you can design. I'm just giving you a couple of examples. In this here on, on, the, on the right, we did a cross coupling first to introduce the aryl group and then an oxidation of the carbon boron bond. So we could get this compound that is the result of a formal hydroxyarylation of the starting cyclobutene. You could also 
functionalize uh, selectively the internal boron atoms through an amination and then do a selective oxidation. And in that way, we could place the oxygen uh, now in the external uh, carbon of the, of the spirocyclobutane. So we could also do a double functionalization uh, of these molecules, just adding uh, enough reagents. So we did, a, for example, a double cephalolefination or a double oxidation. So once we were here, we, we wondered if we could do this in an, in an anti-selective way. So for that, we turned to pl uh, platinum chemistry and we found that using this um, chiral ligand, we were able to perform the diboration in an anti-selective way. Uh, the the anti-selectivity that we observed was not perfect, but one of the nice things was that we could actually do a selective, uh, sorry, a recrystallization in some cases because the products were solid to increase the enantiomeric ratios to uh, levels that were uh, actually synthetically useful. And once you have that in an enantiomeric rich form, you can obviously perform all the kind of transformations that I showed you before to get the enantiomeric rich products. So I've shown you here how we have a built small rings containing boronic esters with a preformed small ring already. So I'm just gonna use the, mm, mm, the next five minutes, which is at the, will the end of my talk, to show you one example of how we have actually built the small ring through a cyclization reaction. And to that, I need to go briefly uh, to one of our very first contributions in this field, what was the borylation of allylic epoxide. So what we were trying to do here is to develop a method to uh, prepare one for diols, such as this here. So we found that we could do that. This is sort of a formal SN2 reaction of the boreal uh, nucleophile boron to the allylic epoxide. And we could control the anti or the syn selectivity in this reaction just by switching the geometry or in the epoxide or in the double bond. So this was actually uh, quite nice. The mechanism in this case, uh, as I shown you before, uh, we perform the copper barrel complex and then we have the insertion of the alkene. And then from here, a beta oxygen elimination would promote the reopening to form a copper alkoxide that can re react again with the diboron compound. So uh, from here, years later, like almost seven years later, we were trying to apply this chemistry actually to a fragment of a natural product, and we needed to have here a phenyl group instead of an alkyl group. So when, when we tried this reaction under the optimized conditions, what we found is that we didn't get the expected product, but we got this cyclopropyl boronate. And uh, this was obtained not in a very good yield, those were not optimized, the conditions, but interestingly, as a single diastereomer. So this was actually quite nice. So we thought that what was going on here is that when we switch an alkyl group by an aryl group, the regiochemistry in the insertion step is switched. So now the copper wants to be in the benzylic position and in doing so, we can promote the intramolecular ring opening to get the cyclopropane ring form. And from here, the reaction with another B pin would actually start over the catalytic cycle. So we could increase the yield, we could optimize up to 81% yield just by switching and increasing the amount of base. So we use potassium terbotoxide, one equivalent, and we could obtain the desired compound in a synthetically useful yield as a single diastereomer. We did that with a bunch of viral groups here, but I just wanna show you a couple of examples because when we switch the trans geometry of the epoxide to the cis, we could obtain a compound that if you compare it with that is a diastereomer. And we could also modify the relative stereochemistry of the B-pin and the R group just by switching the geometry of the alkene in the starting material. So if we control very well both the relative stereochemistry of the oxygen relative to the stereocenter is in the three member ring and we could also control the relative stereochemistry of the B-pin and the aryl group in the small ring. So with these molecules we can also perform different carbon boron bond functionalization. So for example in this case we did a um, Matenson homologation and then an oxidation to get this uh, kind of a highly functionalized cyclopropanol. And in this case we did a Suzuki Mijara cross-coupling reaction to get the cross-coupling product. So I think 
this is the end of uh, the talk what i wanted to tell you today so hopefully i convinced you that by creating boron containing stereo centers we have access to a wide variety of compounds uh, that allow us to create new areas of chemical space and at the same time uh, hopefully allow us to provide uh, valuable synthetic intermediates for other people to use uh, uh, for the preparation of more complex molecules. So I would like obviously to thank the people that uh, have done uh, all this work. So uh, all my PhD students uh, and, and senior postdocs working in the group. I chose this picture, it's, it's a very old one, but it has actually the four people that have developed all the chemistry that uh, I've shown you today, which are Luis, uh, Laura, Victor, and, and Alex, okay? And obviously, because we don't have a very recent picture uh, due to the COVID situation. Finally, I would like to thank all the funding agencies and all of you for your kind attention, and I will be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, Mariola, thank you very much for this very lively talk. Great chemistry. It's amazing what one can do uh, with uh, the bronic acids. And, and nice to see also these strange small ring structures and then uh, the introduction of the functional groups. There are already some questions uh, from the audience. And let me, let me start with the first one. Um, you used, in most of the cases, the B2 Pintu uh, reagent. Can we replace this, at least in part, in the first part of the talk, by um, B pin H, so to have it a bit more economic to make the, the copper complex for the asymmetric correlations you started off with? Right. Uh, unfortunately, no. So we, we try, uh, let me. Let me show you briefly. So, um, so here. So we we try to do uh, be, uh, to use a, a pinnacle boring. So in that case, what happens is you form you don't form a copper boron complex. You form a copper hydride. Okay. So to do this chemistry, you need the copper hydride to do the insertion and then the cyclopropyl copper intermediate to react with the pinnacle boron. To, to get the borrelation. So in theory, it is possible. And we tried that actually, because we thought it was a, a very complementary way. And, and as you said, atom economic to get this, uh, it would not allow us to further functionalize the, the, the intermediate, the copper intermediate. So right. it would allow us only to get hydroboration. Mm -hmm. We tried it and we didn't get good results. I mean, we didn't try it super hard. So I'm not saying that it's not possible. So in theory, yeah, you could optimize at least the hydroboration. You cannot do carboboration chemistry with uh, with pinnacle boring, but the hydroboration in theory it could be possible. In our case, in our hands, uh, we tried and it didn't work. But okay. that's yeah. that cannot be optimized. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Another question addresses the the uh, the ligands because we here see the uh, on on the slide we see the the Zekros ligand. Later, you use the different. Um, ligand. So, so what is known about the the um, the stereochemistry and the coordination directly on the active copper? It's known very little because uh, these copper boil complexes are hard to isolate. So you can isolate them. Uh, well, people have succeeded in, succeed in doing it using um, an enterocyclic uh, complex uh, ligands, NH ligands. Uh, with diphosphine, there's very little done, uh, about very little known uh, in isolation and in, in knowing the, the actual structure of the catalyst. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's a lot of room there. I always get that question. And, and, and unfortunately, there is still uh, a lot of uh, yeah, uncertainty and, and room to, to know about, about it. Because this, this chemistry, I mean, you, you can actually, there are a lot of ligands that work. And in some reaction, is, there are some monodentin ligands that are better. In some reaction, bidentin ligands are better. And there's a still, I mean, the, after all these 15 years of people doing this chemistry, there's a still not a good correlation uh, uh, of ligand uh, metal and, and compared with the, the reaction. So um, I don't have a good answer for that, uh, mm -hmm. but definitely something that we still need to figure out. Yeah, yeah this it is what it is. And uh, there are a lot of kind of uh, Open question, so good research opportunities for the future, definitely. Um, one other question, very specific question, 
Uh, can you perform a cross-coupling reaction on the more hindered boronic ester after the introduction of the OH group on the less hindered carbon? Yeah. I no. think this was possible, no? but maybe you show us the example again. Yeah. Here, for yeah. example, right? Mm -hmm. We're cross-coupling here. Yes. No. No, oh, actually, right. uh, um, so the, the, the cross coupling only works when you have the two boreal moieties. So we, we've done this chemistry, we've done the, also the monoborylation. I haven't shown it here because we didn't have time, okay? But we've done also the monoborylation. And in the monoborylation where the boron is just here, not here, uh, the cross coupling doesn't work, doesn't work. I mean, you need that interaction that, uh, that we believe we have to actually activate, uh, make one of the boronic esters more Lewis acidic. Uh, right. But yeah, it doesn't work with the with the four member ring. It doesn't work with the boronic ester uh, to and the, the standard cross coupling under these conditions, at least. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Um, you you always use alkenes in strained rings here, the four and three membered rings. Of course, uh, one reason is uh, the the target structures. But also, um, you need the lower the lowered energy of the alkene for the, for the chemistry to go. I assume the the the, the same chemistry, so the, the the bisborylation would not work. Let's say with a less strained alkene. Can you comment a little bit on this? How the orbital energies changes in these strained structures? Yeah, well, the, the bisborylation is is a, is I mean, with uh, with non-strain alkenes, is a is a, a known reaction. I mean, it's been done with platinum with mm -hmm. terminal alkenes, and it's been done with metal-free with uh, many many examples. So it's actually for for the for the diborylation, it works because uh, yeah, there's no problem with that uh, with the. In, with the diborylation, what was actually not known was the was the, the diborylation with the cyclobutene. With the copper uh, chemistry, um, there, yeah, the electronics are more important than in, than in the diborylation. And uh, these days, I mean, modifying the ligand, you can you can cover a lot of alkenes. But in the very beginning. The ones that work better were those with electron withdrawing groups. But now there's a lot of uh, a lot of examples uh, with the acyclic alkenes with different electronics, and uh, the tuning of the ligand offers you a lot of possibilities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So your talk definitely inspired here the audience. Many questions, and one question uh, addresses a, a kind of new synthesis target because you showed us that you use these spirocyclobutenes. And, and functionalize this nicely and use this. Can you also use spirocycloproteins? <laughs> we tried to make those. Those are hard mm -hmm. to make. <laughs> Okay. We did not succeed very much, and, and the scope is not so general, but definitely we, we tried those, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, you tried this, but... Uh, they, they, were hard, they were hard to make, and yeah. Uh, and yeah. Mm -hmm. So in general, how do you, uh, what is in your opinion, best way to make the, the, the cyclobutenes? So we, the way we do it is, is pretty robust. I mean, it's a multi-step, I think it's four steps. So we start from the, um, from the exoalkene and we do a two plus two cycle addition with in situ generated dichloroketine. And then we, we remove the chlorides in that, that doesn't need to be isolated. We remove the chlorides, we reduce the carbonyl and then we do the elimination after tosylation. So it's a four step, but you can do it in a multigram and it's very, very robust and general as you can see by the scope, yeah. Right, good. Yeah, we have to slowly come to an end with the questions. There's one question regarding selectivity. In the last part, you showed this application to natural product synthesis or difficult molecule synthesis. Um, what about selectivity? So if in the molecule are different alkenes, Mm -hmm. uh, do you face selectivity problems then? You you can definitely. I mean, then it's all about aesthetic, uh, ele stereoelectronic effects um, that you can play. I mean, definitely you can achieve selectivity. I mean, it depends a lot in the type of alkenes, but. Uh, I mean, I think selectivity can be achieved if there's a, enough difference in, um, in, in, in in electronic character of the olefin or enough difference in, in aesthetics. So it could, is it, is it possible? But definitely, I mean, if you have multi uh, temporal alkenes in your molecules, um, a multi-borrelation can be a problem, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Good. So, as I said, we have to close, come to an end. There are more questions in the chat, and Mariola will go in the chat and answer them in writing so that everybody gets an answer to his or her question. Mariola, thank you again for this very lively and inspiring talk. And with this, thank you. Anna, I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry about the volume. I don't know what happened. Uh, early. Don't worry. It happens. Uh, really don't worry. These things happen. Yeah. So, okay. uh, yeah, great. Okay, thank you. And then, yeah, now we're moving on to um, the last uh, presentation of today's symposium, and this is by um, Jerome Baza. So Jerome studied chemistry at the ETH in Zurich, where he um, obtained his diploma under the supervision of Eric Carrera and Christian Fischer in 2001. In 2002, he started his PhD studies also at the ETH under the supervision of Eric Carrera, which he completed in 2006. Following on, he joined the group of Professor Barry Trost in Stanford as a postdoctoral fellow. In 2007, he returned to Switzerland and he took on a position as an assistant editor in organic chemistry at the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. In 2014, he was promoted to assistant professor and since 2019, he's full professor in organic chemistry at the EPFL in Lausanne. His research interests are very broad but yet the overarching theme is the discovery of new reactivity to enable non-classical bond disconnections. Jerome used actually a Twitter poll to um, yeah, select the topic for, for this talk. And he told me before there was a, a bit of a tie between top, or two topics. And uh, in the end, the majority voted for hypervalent iodine chemistry over strained ring chemistry. So Jerome, we very much look forward to your talk uh, entitled Catalytic Functionalizations with Hypervalent Iodine Reagents. So please share your screen. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Now presentation mode. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jerome. Oh, we cannot. Okay. Okay. So okay. Thank, thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Nish, and I'm very pleased to present a little bit our research program on hypervalent iodine today. So it's naturally very exciting in front of such a large audience. And let me start with just an overview of the research we are doing in my group. Uh, so, in fact, what is the driving common point in my group is finding new reactive intermediate. So we are kind of the opposite of Professor Guy, the first speaker that has the target-oriented approach. We are really thinking first on paper, how could we change the reactivity of functional group? So the concept of umpolung, for example, is very important for us because we think by doing new reactive functional group, we can change the way we do synthetic chemistry. And then these new tools can be filled in the synthesis of complex molecules. One of the best way to do that for our group is the use of hypervalent iodine, this weak bond that allow us to make the umpolung of different functional groups. Uh, the alkyne that I will speak more today, but also other functional groups like cyanide, azide, aromatic groups, alkenes. And uh, naturally we try to select functional groups that are also very important synthetically. The other topic of research in my group are using ring strain, and we see a lot of beautiful small rings already today, so I'm less sad not to be able to speak about them. And finally, we use also smart tethering approach for the functionalization of alkenes, so a new project that we start recently. For today, I will focus my talk on the umpolung of alkyne, and before I come for the topic of today, Okay. Um, so we can still see you, but your slide is not moving. Yes, my slides are frozen. Yeah, yeah. And maybe again escape and then. Try yes, I'm trying to do that. Yeah. Mm 
right so i need to completely okay. restart yeah <laughs> no problem take your time mm -hmm. yeah here they are okay i'm yeah. back on okay <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> sorry for that uh it, it's not pretty hard that this powerpoint is freezing but okay um so i wanted first to go to the introduction before i go to today's topic i think it's interesting to understand why we started this research and how we came to it and how sometimes the, the easy design that you have at the beginning need to be changed uh, so when we think about alkyne chemistry and i was familiar of it through my PhD on postdoc, we think naturally of alkyne as acetylite. And I think it's great to have an obvious disconnection, but also sometimes it limits what you can do because you think only along this way of nucleophilicity for alkyne. But if you would think of having an alkyne plus synton, you can change the disconnection you do. And sometimes you change the way you make molecule or you make even new molecules because new disconnection become accessible. On, on paper, I first wanted to do that using simple iodoalkyne. And at that time, there was really no evidence that this could work well because they have low reactivity. They are even used as iodination reagents. So these obvious ideas didn't seem to have a lot of promise. And I, what I get first acquainted with these hypervalent iodine reagents. So these reagents are fascinating because of the big atom, the iodine atom, you can break the octet rules and you can make this type of hypervalent bond. So you can describe this hypervalent bond as an overlap of 3p orbitals. And if you do that, you will realize that two electrons are in fact in a non-bonding orbitals. So these bonds are kind of only half bond and weaker than normal covalent bond. And the alkyne reagent was known already since a long time. It was discovered in the 60s by Beringer. And the new kind of a golden time in the 80s and the 90s under the impulsion of the group of Stang and Oshii and later Victor Duncan. And we were thinking when we started in 2006, this is very exciting reactivity and we could use it to make new disconnection. And the first one we are wondering is this one where you have the Nindol, the most nucleophilic uh, heterocycle and this commercially available alkenyl yodium salt. And it was also the time where a lot of people were developing CH activation on indoles. Maybe just the name of Melanie Sanford and Matthew Gaunt should be named in this relationship. They developed the palladium on the copper catalyzed approach. But we tried a lot there. More than 20 catalysts on of condition, and it never works. We always get decomposition of this alkenyl yodium salt. And in retrospect, such an obvious disconnection would already have been done by others if it will be working so easily. So the key problem was the stability of this alkenyl iodine salt. And we were aware at this time that cyclic hypervalent iodine reagent were used more and more as more stable equivalent of the alkenyl iodine salt. Especially my colleague Antonio Toni in ETH Zurich had recently introduced the Toni reagent for trifluoromethylation. And we realized that the antinyl benzodoxolone with an alkyne have been discovered in 1991 by Oshii. And later the synthesis was improved by Zdankin but they were never used in synthetic chemistry. And for us, it, it was the time where we realized the potential of this reagent because we were able to develop the gold catalyzed transformation that was highly selective for the C3 position of indole and very convenient to use because it was just open flask with commercially available gold chloride. And there was also a factor of luck there because we find out that this reagent was a very general reagent. It, find, it has a fine-tuned reactivity, sufficient stability, but still enough reactivity to allow a lot of different transformation in CH functionalization, alkene functionalization, functionalization of nucleophiles. Or for today's, I will focus more on our recent work on carbene functionalization and radical functionalization. And over the time, other people start also to use this reagent. And in 2016, we made a review on the topic and it's still continuing. And now there is more and more of these new transformations that are being developed. Uh, most of these transformation are focusing in just transferring the alkyne group. And for today's talk, I wanted to discuss reactions that are, allow you to get a faster access towards molecular complexity, namely reactions that give you access to multifunctionalization in a single step. And I will start with 1-1 one -one defunctionalization of a diazo compound. So this topic has been started by a very talented postdoc, Durga Ari. And yes, I think it's the same Durga Ari that asked a question before in the chat. So he started all this diazo chemistry. And the most recent result has been obtained by a very talented PhD student, Guillaume Pizella, that just defended his PhD. 
So what is the original ID behind that? When we look on the carbene, a carbene naturally can do CH insertion, it can do cyclopropanation, but we especially think about it as a kind of dual synton. It has a nucleophilic position and an electrophilic position. On the last decade or so, many people have started to use this dual property of carbene. You can generate them easily from diazo compound to get these metal carbenoids, especially with rhodium and copper catalyst. And then you can think about adding an electrophile or a nucleophile onto the molecules. And from the point of view of what has been done, a broad range of nucleophiles can be used, aromatic rings, alkynes, heteroatoms. And the broad range of electrophiles can also be used, being proton was the first fluorine different conjugated system or other electrophilic reactive reagent. And just to give an example of alkanylation, I liked a lot this example by Jambo Wang, that is one of the key players in the field, that developed this nucleophilic alkanylation based on a rhodium catalyst, and then use an electrophil alkyl alkylation to get this compound. And naturally, we were interested to try this type of reactivity with our electrophilic alkyne syntone, the ethinyl benzodoxolone. And we started with rhodium catalysis under the condition developed by, by uh, Wen Bao Wu. Uh, and we were aiming for this compound via three component reactions. And we were not able to develop this transformation. The only compound you can get under this condition is the compound resulting of CH formation. So what probably occur is that the first step of the transformation works. The alcohol is adding onto the diazo compound, but then you get a very fast hydrogen transfer to get directly to the product, and we are not able to intercept this intermediate with the EBX reagent. So we didn't have really an idea how to improve this process, so we turned to systematic screening, and in particular, we tried copper as catalyst instead of rhodium, and this was of the key reaction performed at that time. Uh, we still didn't get only traces of the product, and at the time, we were not able to optimize to this product. But in the reaction mixture, beside dimers, on oxidation product, there was a very interesting minor compound that there was this compound, a de-addition product, where the full reagent has been added to the diazo compound. And Durga was able to optimize this reaction. He was even able to go a further step to go to an uh, enantioselective transformation that works very nicely with ethyl diazoacetate and different alkyne. Uh, here is just one example that you can get to this chemistry. Uh, and just to show you that sometimes it's not easy to make what can be looking as a small jump. So one of the goal of the PhD thesis of uh, Guillaume Pizella was to develop the same reaction using the vinyl reagent. So this vinyl reagent has been developed by my colleague Barry Tolofsson in Stockholm. And we are thinking the analogy is very close. So doing similar reaction condition, you should get also a very efficient process. And the racemic method was in fact not too difficult to develop. But up to today, we were never able to get high enantiomer selectivity, even screening a broad range of ligand. So that show you that even small change can lead to very big change when you are working with enantiomer selectivity. But for today, what I would like to speak about is a story that happened where we are trying to screen for this reaction, a kind of accident that allows us to solve another problem. When we look at this transformation, the EE was not exceptional, but Guillaume realized there was a side product form in the reaction, and he was passionate enough to isolate and identify a side product. And he realized it was a three-component reaction, where the tertamyl alcohol that he has as a solvent mixture in a kind of desperate act to try to increase the EE, as incorporated into the product. And that was naturally for us interesting, because it was what we have been trying to do a few years before, and we are not successful. Sometimes when you try to solve another problem, you find a solution uh, to something you were looking for a long time, but you just need to be ready for this accident. Uh, is that a solution to the three component reactions? So just performing the reaction in pure ethanol, you indeed can increase the yield of this compound to 50%. And this is a general process. You can do that with the alkanylation and you get up to 63% of the three component product. But that's naturally not great to use one of your partner as a solvent. And you would like to be much more efficient. But if you go down to only 10 equivalent of ethanol, what is still already a lot, uh, you get only 22% of the product. So we needed to find a way to block the addition of the benzoate. And this benzoate is surprisingly nucleophilic. So the idea was finally to change the hyperventide reagent. 
is you have this uh, exisofluoropropanol propanol derived compound. The reactivity is now much lower, much lower nucleophilicity, and you can get only the desired product. However, this reaction is sluggish, and it takes a lot of time to go to completion, and it gives you a racemic product. So we find out that if you remove the ligand, you can now get a nearly quantitative yield of this compound in a much shorter reaction time. So it seems that the ligand is inhibiting this type of reaction, whereas it was helping the other transformation. Finally, under this condition, we can go to four equivalent of ethanol only, so it gets efficient for um, precious alcohol, and you get only traces of the addition of the exisofluoropropanol derivative and very good yield of the desired product. So I will not focus too much on the scope of this transformation. Uh, just to show you the advantage of this three-component reaction is the structural diversity. Because you can change the three component of the reaction, so you can change the alkyne in red, the alcohol is in blue, and the diazo compound in green. You can really get a broad diversity of compound uh, in, with, in fact, stereo centers that is naturally, as we saw in the previous talk, very important for these flatland issues. Naturally, what would need to be solved in the future would be to get an enantioselective transformation to also get this compound enantiopure. For the moment, they are all racemic. A short application. Uh, you may know the drug efavirenz. It's a very important drug for HIV that contains an alkyne. And this drug is synthesized by Lonza from the intermediate ear. We are just uh, the coupling, CN coupling at this position. And we are able to get this Lonza intermediate uh, using in one step from the diazo compound, the carbamate on the alkyne. So this carbamate is more nucleophilic on oxygen. So it will react with the oxygen and then the third butyl group will be cleaved, give you the free carbamate. And naturally, now you can start to vary the two partners here to get more analogs. So at this point, uh, we were a little bit frustrated by the fact that we were not able to develop an selective transformation in several cases, and that we have found the way to make the three-component reaction no, more than luck by design. So we think about how this reaction could be working. And we come back to the simplest system we know best, the diazoacetate with the EBX reagent, and we just put a fluorine to be able to monitor the reaction between 19F and MR. Our intention was to make now classical kinetics to just look at the orders on the different reagents. And when you do this type of reaction, you, uh, you get this bad surprise. Uh, that is not at all what you would expect for a normal reaction with the reaction starting fast and diminishing with concentration. Uh, what you get is a kind of sigmoidal uh, process. And if you put more catalyst, the reaction is even slower at the beginning and then accelerate very fast to finish abruptly. And if you put less catalyst, uh, the reaction kind of start okay, but then can never, never complete. So it seems to be a very, very complex process from the kinetic point of view. And we are not able to publish yet quantitative data on this process. Uh, nevertheless, we make a qualitative analysis and try to understand how does it works. And we realize that this very interesting initiation period can be modified depending on what you add at the start of the reaction. So if you add more diazo compound, you eat up the reaction, or you add the product, simply the product of the transformation, the initiation period is shortened. However, if you add more EBX reagent, you increase this initiation period. And these make us think that maybe you have a non-productive interaction between the catalyst and the EBX reagent. And we start to look for this type of interaction. A first way to look on that is just experimentally by looking by NMR. And depending on the, on the ligand you have on copper, you are able to see two interactions by NMR by observing change in chemical shift. And it looks like that copper ligated with dinitrogen ligand will favor to coordinate on the oxygen, whereas uh, copper with, without any ligand on the benzodoxol will make a complex on the alkyne. So with the help of Dr. Matt Vodrich, we performed then some simplified calculation. And we, we find out three interaction complex. Two are with the ABX and one with the diazo compound. And as you can see from this number, the copper alkyne complex is uh, the most favored one. Then come the copper carboxylate. And finally, the copper diazo is the less favored. However, if you look on how the reaction is happening afterwards, uh, we found out that the carboxylate of the reagent can add to the carbon center. 
And to go to this intermediate, you cannot find any pathway from the coordinate alkyne. There is just no energy that allows that. It's pretty high in energy to go there from the coordinated EBX reagent, but from the diazo compound, you have a very low energy pathway where you can go directly to this intermediate that is later productive. So it really kind of shows that you may have two complexes that are not productive form very fast, and you need to decoordinate it to react with your diazo compound to go to the desired intermediate. So we then try to compute the full um, profile of this reaction. And if you start with the formation of the diazocarbene that seems to be favored, so this reaction works pretty nicely. And then this copper carbene intermediate reacts without any barrier with the EBX reagent on the oxygen to form this key intermediate. To continue for this key intermediate, you, you need now to make the so-called Berry rotation on the hypervalent iodine to bring the alkyne closer to the copper center. And this has a cost in energy, but it's not too high. It's only nine kilocalories. And then we were able to locate a transition state where you have a direct transfer of the alkyne to the inolate center and the copper is leaving. And that was also for us a surprise because we were thinking the alkyne will first move to the copper and you get reductive elimination, but we were never able to, to locate such a transition state. Nevertheless, this transition state is still high in energy. It can be lower in energy depending on the ligand, but it's still surprising high for a reaction that run normally at room temperature or at 40 degrees. So we were wondering if we are still missing something in the pictures. On one of the questions we have, okay, if the intramolecular pathway looks difficult, maybe there's an intermolecular pathway. So Guillaume did these very nice uh, reactions where we kind of uh, mixed two reagents with the diazo compound uh, with two different substituents on the alkyne, so the red alkyne and the, the orange one, and then two different benzoate core. And on the top, we have the two products you will expect for the intramolecular process, the two recombining with the same partner. But in fact, you get also the cross alkylation product. So you have a transfer of alkyne between the reagent and the intermediate. And the question would be, uh, how did they transfer? And it could be that this reactive intermediate is alkylated by the next tonal alkyne, and then you begin to mix up the two reactive intermediate. So to conclude on this part of the talk, uh, we have started with a very spe simple speculative mechanism where the copper carbene will react, uh, will the copper will react to form the copper carbene, will then add with the oxygen, and then will make an intramolecular alkyne transfer to get to the product. But the more we look at, the less you understand. We now know that this kind of pre-complexation uh, pre of the copper are probably very important for understanding the kinetic of the reaction. And we have the hypothesis that there is an intermolecular alkyne transfer. At the moment you do that, you now have a benzoate that can re-enter your catalyst cycle and form different type of intermediate. So the, there is the kind of case, the more you try to understand, the less you discover and the more you need to progress to try to understand this transformation. And in the last, in uh, five minutes of my talk, I would like to speak about 1-2 defunctionalization instead of 1-1 uh, defunctionalization. So this is a research that's been done nearly exclusively by Stephanie after some preliminary results by our senior postdoc, uh, Stefano. And to understand this defunctionalization, I need to go to a step back and speak a little bit about radicals. So the reaction of hypervalent iodine reagent, the EBX reagent with radical has been discovered by Li in the SIOC in Shanghai using stoichiometric oxidant to generate the radical from the acid. It was able to get the alkyne in very good yield. And we contributed to this field together with uh, Xiao group by developing photoredox conditions that are much milder to do the same transformation. And based on this first pioneering work on many other experience in the literature, we know now that this ABX is a very interesting somophilic reagent. So it's not able to react with nucleophile only, but it reacts very well with nucleophilic radicals. And we wanted to link that with enamide chemistry because enamide are great starting material. They give you amine building blocks that are multifunctionalized. And the classical way to use their reactivity is just to put an electrophile on the nucleophile to get to a new bond. Recently, several researchers, and especially Geraldine Masson and Isabel Guileso, have developed uh, the radical-based approach where you will use an electrophilic radical developed derived from a diester or trifluoromethyl radical, oxygen radical, and will then, under oxidative condition, add a nucleophile. And we wondered again 
if you could make an umpolung of this process. So that's an approach that has been developed by Nikevicts, where you can get a radical cation, then add a nucleophile at the terminal position and trap the radical. And the tough part here is the trapping of the radical because Nikevicts had reported only the trapping of the radical with a H dot donor. So only hydrogen can be intro introduced there. And we naturally thought that our reagent has the ideal character to do this type of transformation with the somophilic character of the alkyne and the nucleophilic character of the benzoate. So this is the preliminary result obtained by Stefani and Stefano. Uh, we use our favorite organocatalyst for photoredox condition. This 4Z-IPN is a nice mild oxidant in the excited stage. And we get instead 30% of the desired compound. As the reaction was very slow, we move to a stronger oxidant. So you just need to add chlorine on the carbazole and you switch the oxidation potential to a stronger oxidant. And at this point, we could increase the yield. And then come the things that uh, you don't want to have in the lab. You make a new batch of your reagent and your yield drop. Uh, so that was naturally the question, what is happening there? So we improved the protocol for the synthesis of the ABX reagent. We get very nice crystalline compound. And this nice pure compound gives you also 36% of yield. So it tells you that you need it to be a little bit dirty to get the good yield. So what could be this impurity that is important for the reactions? So the way you prepare this reagent is you use the iodine 3 precursor and then you add an alkylating reagent. So we thought that this iodine 3 precursor would be important for the transformation. And indeed, if you add uh, this acetate benzodoxalone, you can get back the good yield and the fine tuning of the reaction solvent gives you now 78% of yield for these transformations. So it was uh, very important, in fact, to identify this type of impurity. It's not so much of subtrial because Yun Chen and other people have already demonstrated that this kind of co-accident can be very important in photoredox mediated reaction with benzodoxalone reagent. Again, I will not go too long on the scope. So the reaction works well with a different type of enamide, either cyclic or non-cyclic enamides. So this one is a nice example because it can selectively functionalize the enamide alkenes in presence of the aliphatic alkenes. And it's not limited to enamides. You can also functionalize enol ethers. And you can vary the alkyne partner. So how does this transformation work? Our hypothesis is that the activated photocatalyst will activate the enamide to make the radical cation. It is thermodynamically feasible because we know from cyclic voltammetry that this oxidative uh, catalyst, this excited, excited catalyst is strong enough to oxidize the enamide. And we have also a second indication by a stern Fulmer experiment. So if you look at the fluorescence of the catalyst and you add this enamide, you will quench nicely uh, the fluorescence of the catalyst. So this first step looks realistic. At this point, it's more speculative. Uh, we have an attack of the benzoate on the terminal position for working the alpha amine radical. The alpha amine radical will then react with the EBX reagent to make the alkanylation on the iodosyl radical. And we think that the iodosyl radical should close the catalytic cycle by oxidizing the ground state of the catalyst. And this is really easy feasible based on the thermodynamic of the transformation. So where does the iodoxyl uh, benzoxyl acetate come in this picture? So we think is especially sustaining the reaction by generating more of the two iodobenzoyl radical and indirectly more of the iodobenzoate. We know it is not absolutely necessary for the reaction, but it can improve it a lot. And this is the way we think this reaction is working. And we are now trying also to develop a three component reaction where the nucleophile will not be the one coming from the reagent, but another nucleophile that would be added to the alkenes this way. Okay, so I'm come to the, the end of my talk. And I also like to show at the labyrinth at the end, like uh, Professor Guy was showing in his introduction. And our approach to the labyrinth is a little bit more brutal force. So we are maybe not so clever to find the, bad, the best way to the end. So what we do, we break the walls by making new reactions that were not possible before. And this way we can be more direct in the synthesis of organic molecules. I like to thank again all my groups. So we solved this issue of the COVID situation by making individual photos and then making them together digitally so that we can still get a group picture for this year. 
So I already named the student that participated to the chemistry. I would like also to thank our collaborators, uh, Matt Vodrich and Clemence Kormabeuf for the calculation, the different funding agency that support our research. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer again for the invitation and all of you for your kind attention. And I will be very happy to answer all the questions you may have. Yeah, dear Jerome, thank you very much for the nice and exciting talk. So that was uh, interesting. Chemistry, hypervalent iodine and uh, carbene. So uh, a lot of good structures. We have already quite some questions in the chat. Let me start addressing one of the points <clears throat> you briefly touched that the Enancy selective version is still missing of um, the one of the reactions. And here is a suggestion how to solve this. You simply use chiral NHC ligands for your catalysis on there. Have you tried this already? Uh, we, we tried the NHC ligand in the very, very first project. So the, if I just go back to the different project, um, we try it in the initial project on the... Yes, this initial project where we're making the right. C2 addition. Um, these, they were not active as catalysts at all. Uh, like copper phosphine and copper carbine didn't work at all. I have to say we need to move now for the three component reaction to try, it will be very interesting for the three component reaction to be able to develop an ion selective transformation. What we know is there the bidentate ligands are slowing down a lot the reaction. So what we need to have would be a monodentate ligand. So maybe indeed the carbene, uh, we didn't test them in this transformation, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not sure the electronic is right because it's it, as it was completely deactivating in the other process. But yes, it could be interesting to try the carbene in the, the three component reactions, yeah. Great, okay, yeah. Another specific question, have you tried transformations with diazo compounds using vinyl diazo esters? Yes. Uh, and these reactions are very interesting because um, what you obtain is in fact uh, the rearranged product where you have the oxygen at one position and the alkyne at the conjugated position. So you get the, the N9 product. So I didn't speak about that it's because we obtained that in the early stage where we are developing the racemic reaction. Uh, the, and this works very well with the vinyl where you get the 1,4 adduct or not the 1,2. So there was some interesting work of Hugh Davis about this competition, 1,2 and on 1,4. So we get ex exclusively the 1,4. But again, when we try to make an electrolysis transformation, it didn't work. We get very low EE. And that's something we have generally observed. Um, the generality of the, uh, the electrolysis selective transformation is usually more limited than the, um, the, the racemic one. But that's a very well-known fact. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we just see here this slide on there. You you showed us these these uh, amazing difference in selectivity going from the linear alkyne to the to the alkene on there. Um, yeah. I, I'm I'm pretty sure you have thought a lot about this. Um, yeah. What is your most likely explanation that the selectivity drops so so dramatically? Yes. Uh, honestly, if we know why, uh, well, if we will know. What's happening? We will have tried to solve the issue. And uh, well, at this point, we are not understanding if it was a difference of the mechanism or just a difference of steric interaction in the same transition state. So that would be probably the two hypotheses. And that's where we realize, okay, we really need to look uh, in depth on our simplified mechanistic pictures because there was, we had even in this publication, a very simple cartoon where we said the carbine was bind this way and one face was blocked and that allow you to predict the, the right absolute configuration. But mm -hmm. I think that's just a cartoon that has no real physical meaning. And uh, we really need to understand the mechanism to be able to, to find out what is the influence on the enhancer selectivity. And that's where we started our kinetics and co computation studies that are not yet conclusive enough to know what is the exact mechanism. So you are kind of a little bit stuck uh, by the knowledge at this point. Huh? All right, yeah. Uh, yeah this, this is certainly a challenging point to really f understand the molecular details. Yeah. Other questions in the chat address uh, or are into our um, uh, aim for the hypervalent iodines because 
uh, you have to make them. You cannot simply just buy them. You quickly referred to this because you showed the picture of the nice crystals that you generated mm -hmm. the synthesis on there. Maybe you can quickly just refer on this on what scale, how many steps, how, how easy is the access to this important starting material here for this chemistry? Yeah. Uh, a few of them are, in fact, commercially available, but they are really uh, outrageously expensive. Um, it depends a little bit of which one of the reagents you want. So, for example, the, the Tipsy Bakes, the first reagent we developed that is most generally used, that's only a one-step synthesis where you use the 2 udo benzoate a terminal alkyne on MCPBA as oxidant. So mm -hmm. we were inspired by the work of Barry Tolofsson. Uh, the small change we did is that Barrett was using the alkynyl boronic and we could use the terminal alkyne. So at the end, it's one step from commercially available compound and the reaction is working well on the 40 gram scale. So you can get oh. 40 grams of this compound. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, pu we published a recent report in OPRD uh, where in fact we collaborate with Merck to study also all the profile of the reaction, looking if there was exotherms and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they find some interesting details. So the compound is perfectly stable up to 150 degrees, unless you are not careful and you have like tosylate salt from the synthesis still in there, and mm -hmm. then you get more unstable. So this purity is pretty important. Uh -huh. uh, if you want to make other reagent, it is sometimes a two-step procedure that is more efficient, where you first oxidize the iodine and then mix up the two. And that is the case for this phenylabix that uh, for the second project, so this one, we now have a um, second protocol. And what is uh, very important to get the high purity is even more than the synthesis is the workup. Because at the beginning, uh, these compounds are highly crystalline. They crash out of the solution. Uh, and we took the easy way to just triturate them in a solvent to purify them. And mm -hmm. if you do that, you don't remove all the impurities. But if you make a real recrystallization, you can get them very pure. And for me, a little bit surprising, most of these compounds are also well purified by standard chromatography. So mm -hmm. you just need to be a little bit fast, do not lose us on the chromatography, but most of them are stable on colon and you can use standard colon chromatography. Mm -hmm. To address the, the issue of chirality, one can also think of chiral hypervalent iodine to introduce the chirality. I'm pretty sure you have thought about this. Any, any comment? Uh, yeah, we have made a few. There is still, uh, we have a recent uh, work that we soon come with a uh, sulfoximine collaboration with the Mania group. We had made uh, earlier on the mental groups here. Um, at the end, we see very, very low induction in the range of 5, 10% at the best. Uh, often because the reactive position is here on the alkyne and all the auxiliary you put will be far away so it's very difficult or you need to design a huge auxiliary that will be very expensive to make so we have a little bit you know, go away for this chemistry uh, I, there is one successful attempt in the literature by the Pusegu and Kido group where they put this type of alkyne in binafetyl derivatives and they could get relatively good enantio induction in the transfer of this alkyne but still, there is the big issue that this is stoichiometric reagent. So what we are trying to do in other type of transformation is, is trying to develop a reaction that will be catalytic and iodine. And then you could think of using much more precious reagent. But we are a little bit stopped on the idea of the stoichiometric reagent because we think it will be anyway not convenient to use. Right. OK, I understand. Yeah. Um, Maybe we have, to, we have to come to the last uh, questions on there and, and um, they go more in the direction of applicability of the chemistry. Maybe you can also comment a little bit on this. When I look at the starting material, so you have a carbene precursor, you have a hypervalent iodine reagent. It is relatively expensive, uh, the chemistry on there, um, when you compare it with other ways on there. Um, and then is it possible to do this chemistry also on a continuous flow basis? Uh, because that would be important to apply it to, let's say, medicinal chemistry or at even at larger and, and very defined reaction conditions. Yeah. So I think at this stage, as long as we have the stoichiometric hypervalent iodine reagent, we are more making tools for discovery. So the interest is that you can very fast get your compound with uh, non-natural connectivity. And you can make, uh, especially in this multi-component reaction, you can make very fast diverse compound that will be very long. So if you want to target one single of this compound, I will probably not use this type of chemistry. I will develop another pathway that is maybe uh, less elaborate in the reagent. Mm -hmm. But if you want to make 
the library of diverse compounds, this chemistry is very modular and very fast, then it's a good way to do that. Uh, okay. Then on the question of flow chemistry, um, you are thinking of using that. So we have just a few starting, especially when you want to use diazo compound that are uh, less stable or mm -hmm. apparent iodine reagents that are less stable. So the alkyne are very stable, but if you use the azido compound, then you have more issue. And there, I think flow could have definitely an advantage also from the point of view of safety. But um, I think unless you make the reagent, uh, the reaction more catalytic in iodine, uh, this, uh, this is not the process you want to use in, um, in ton scale to make a drug. That's the process you want to use if you need like uh, 100 milligram of uh, structure and you want to get it fast and diversified. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you for the very, very clear and honest answer on there, because this is, of course, also something we have to have to always consider when when looking at, at chemical processes on there. And, and I would definitely agree with uh, what you said. So that brings us to the end. Thank you, Jerome, for the great presentation and the discussion there. It was great having you here. Thank you to all of our three speakers. Uh, and uh, with this, I give back to Anne to close our symposium. Thank you very much, uh, Burkhardt, and especially also for the great moderation of this event. And a big thank you to all of our three speakers for their fantastic talks. Lastly, um, yeah, a big thank you for our or to our viewers for, for joining in in such high numbers again, and also for the lively discussions. To let you know that the next event is also coming up soon. And for this, I would like to share the following slide to so I hope you can see it. So our next virtual symposium is together with our sister journal chemistry methods and it's on the topic of automated synthesis from planning to execution. It will take place on May 12th and the speakers are Klaus Jensen, Peter Seeberger and Nessa Carson and the whole event is moderated by Leroy Cronin. The uh, registration is already open, and for this, uh, please check out the Chemistry Methods Twitter account and the Chemistry Europe Hub, and we will also announce it soon on the Eurojock Twitter page. Okay. And with this, um, oh, can you see me again? Yes, yeah. And with this, I would like to um, officially close the event now. And yeah, thank you, everyone, and hope to see you at the next event in May. Goodbye and take care. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Juan. Bye. Bye.